Hi everyone, welcome to my review of Terence Malick's Days of Heaven. Um, now, if you've seen my uh, reviews on my channel, you know, regarding Terence Malick, um, you'll know that when he's at his best, he's one of my absolute favourite filmmakers. Um, you know, based on his first three and the Tree of Life, I think he's one of the best filmmakers, you know, and, and as, I've, as I've said before, two of his first three films um, are in my top 50 of all time. Um, and of course, if you've seen my Badlands review, you'll know that Badlands is one of them. Uh, but I did say at the end of that review that um, I don't think it's his best film. Uh, I think that actually he made a better film. Um, you'll find out if it's this or Thin Red Lion um, soon enough. Um, but yes, uh, Days of Heaven is... Um, I watched it on Criterion, re-watched it. Uh, this is my third viewing. Um, but yes, Days of Heaven. Um, it's along with Badlands, he's most uh, acclaimed uh, you know, by critics. And, um, you know... At the time, it you know it was a budget of three million, so it was a lot more than uh, Badlands, which was uh, you know three hundred thousand, uh, I believe. Uh, but it didn't do too well at the box office. Uh, Days of Heaven, it just got back its you know just um, got back its budget really, um, and you know a lot of the people at the time you know criticised it, even critics, um, saying it looked stunning, of course, um, but it, you know it didn't have much depth and stuff, and no one to really care for. Um, I really don't understand how anyone could have ever said this. For me personally, um, because the characters in this film are some of the absolute greatest in cinema uh, for me. And, uh, you know, I said how much I love Badlands and how much I can relate to Badlands. Uh, you know, how much we're, we're offered grounded characters, um, you know, and, and then he takes us to this spiritual place <coughs> through them, through, through the grounded uh, relationships, emotions, and of course the narration. Um, but, you know, I did say, of course, a dreamlike effect it has on you. Uh, this film really amps everything he does, you know, in Badlands up to, you know, infinity. Because, you know, this film, um, just, you know, the characters in this film, I cared so much about them. Uh, you know, and the way they're written, um, so wonderful. You know, the, the script, once again, it's written and directed by Terence Malick, which, you know, all his films are. And, um, you know, I said before, Badlands has one of the best scripts in cinema. And, you know, this has got one that rivals it. It really does. Um, the characters have developed so wonderfully throughout this film. Um, but basically, it's about these uh, rich gear, of course. Uh, it's kind of the main. Well, you could say the the guy that kind of the character that starts off the the, the narrative. You know, the the drive to the film because early on you see him. Um, you know, he's a steel worker in Chicago, and uh, this is set. You know, in the nineteen ten Chicago, um, and he basically kills. I think it's his supervisor. Um, <clears throat> you know, and he's then basically on the run, of course, from the law. Um, and then, you know, very early on, he, he, he takes away his, his girlfriend and um, his little sister as well. Um, and they basically go uh, and try and find work, um, you know, in, in basically, um, you know, places that they, the law wouldn't catch up with them, basically. Um, they end up on this kind of farm and uh, they end up kind of, um, you know, um, tending to wheat and everything in the fields. And, you know, working away, you know, just all day long. Um, and basically after that, you know, uh, it turns into this kind of, um, there's this plot that happens to kind of uh, Richard Gere kind of, uh, I won't go into too much, but, you know, he he basically, uh, he says to Abby, who is uh, played by Brooke Adams wonderfully, he says, you know, this farmer, uh, try and uh, try and marry him. Uh, and then we can kind of, because he's, he's you know, he's, he's learned early on that he's very ill, the, far, the um, you know, the farmer. Um, and basically marry, marry him and then, you know, when he dies, you basically get, uh, you know, come into all the money and we'll be able to, you know, live, you know, in wealth. Um, and of course, um, things don't go according to plan. And, uh, you know, across the 90 minutes or so, which is very short once again, um, you know, many things happen. Um, but this film, you know, that's the plot, you know, that's not enough to, to describe this film because... It's a film like no other, um, just like Badlands, but even more so. And, uh, you know, if you've seen anything like The Tree of Life, you'll know that Malik is not, you know, a traditional filmmaker, you could say. Uh, and this really is his most unique film for me. Um, although, I think it's a bit more traditional in its narrative, in, in a way, to Badlands even. Um, because it has got, you know, more plot points, more, you know, hierarchy. You know, it's got a love triangle in the film and stuff like that. Badlands was very sparse, um, very loose in, in terms of that. It was just really them on the run. Um, you could say that in terms of um, some elements of, 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 uh, of cinema, this is more traditional uh, in the sense it does have things, uh, you know, in a, a more traditional romance, you could say, than Badlands. Um, 
and you know it, it's it's just um, it's got more it's got an actual original score as well, um, which first of all you know absolutely wonderful you know one of the best scores in cinema for me, Ennio Morricone, um, one of my absolute favourite film composers. There's only one guy that I think um, is a better composer than him, and even still you know it's very very close. Um, I think this is in his top three scores, uh, Morricone. Uh, and you know it rivals Once Upon a in the West, um, and even The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly for for, for the uh, you know one of the absolute best scores you know in cinema. <clears throat> and this is much more of an uh, you know emotional score um, than his previous uh, works. So, you know it's kind of on the line with uh, Once Upon a Time in the West uh, more than you know his other westerns that he worked on. Um, the score in this film is absolutely stunning. It's so warm, uh, magical. You know it just adds to the experience, and you know even just the the opening titles when it's used, uh, some of it, and uh, the music is used, sorry, uh, you know, the opening titles and you get the photographs and stuff, given that authenticity, and you know, this film never lets up, it always maintains its tone, uh, and the fact that it's a period piece, you know, it's con con so consistent, you know, the vision that Malik was going for, um, but you know, the, the actual score, the original score by Morricone, you know, there's so many standout tracks, you know, Harvest, um, Happiness, which is... For me, one of the best, absolute best uh, scores, you know, pieces of score in cinema, um, and it's just so emotional, um, and just you know everything, the return as well. If you, if you check that one out, um, the way the music is used in this film is really like another. Um, it's just perfectly used, um, and it's just mind blowing, really, um, and just so overwhelming. The, the music in itself, you know, I listen to the soundtrack uh, more than any other Malik films, um, and. You know, there's, there's usually every other day at least I listen to this soundtrack. Um, and it's just so comforting, uh, but also overwhelmed with emotions. Um, it's just so, you know, melancholy, um, nostalgic, you know, and this film is so nostalgic. Um, the first time I saw it, even, and I'd never seen it before, I'd never really heard too much of the music, apart from a couple of tracks. But it just hit me straight away in the credits, even. Um, and, then, you know, just the film just constantly just builds and builds um, to a final act that really is just one of the most emotional um, and perfectly realised acts in cinema, final acts in cinema. Um, but, you know, I, I really don't understand how um, how some people can, you know, at the time, the critics, uh, you know, were saying this is empty and stuff. Because, you know, from the very moment that you hear, you know, Linda Mance, uh, Mance's voice, uh, who plays Linda, of course, um, the narration, you know, it just sucks you in, and um, it's a very, very unique narration once again, you know, even better than the Badlands one, I, I think, um, which was already revolutionary, <clears throat> in the way it just kind of, basically the narration is from the girl, uh, Linda, and uh, most of the film is kind of seen through her eyes, you could say, her perspective, and that gives it the sense of, adds to the sense of wonder, you know, it's just such a, a film full of wonder, um, and it's, it's matched, you know, by the just everything, the performances and the way that Terence Malick directs this film, but you know, the narration straight away, uh, it's just so relatable, you know, and some of it, you know, it, it's, it's so so natural in the way that it's properly from her point of view. Again, you know, it's, it's a character that she's a character that's not too clever, um, you could say, um, and she, you know, some of the stuff she says, it's just so real because it doesn't seem scripted, and of course, it was kind of improvised, um, of course, and. Uh, you know, Malik kind of let her uh, you know, <coughs> kind of do her own thing at times. Um, and it just works so wonderfully. It gives it even more of a natural feel. Um, and it's just a perfect choice for, for a narrator because she's not really involved in the main plots and the drama of it all, uh, you know, the point, plot points and the drama. Um, she's not, uh, you know, involved in the, the out, you know, the massive scenes really. Uh, but she narrates and it gives it this other la another layer to the film. And it has that sense of wonder, you know, because you see from her point of view and uh, how she's interpreting things. Uh, and it actually adds to the tragedy of it as well, you know. Um, but the characters in this film, you know, overall, are absolutely stunning. Um, Terence Malick, what he does in this film, um, <clears throat> I think he actually develops the characters even better than he does in Badlands. Because at first, you know, the first 20, 25 minutes, um, you don't really hear too much dialogue um, from the characters. Um, it's more you just observe them, what they, what's going on, you know, the, the adventure, of what's going on, they're moving to different... And, you know, this is definitely an adventure film. Uh, it's an epic film, and it covers so much ground within that 90 minutes. But really, yes, you, you see them kind of just through their actions first. And, of course, the relationship just so naturally built up between uh, <coughs> Richard Gere's character 
um, and Brooke Adams, um, Bill and Abby, and uh, you know, it, for me, it's one of the best uh, romances in cinema. Um, but of course, it develops into this love triangle um, as the film progresses. But you know, you see them, you kind of see them through their actions first, <clears throat> and you kind of just feel, you know, the emotions and the relationships between them all. Then you start to hear, you know, you start to actually get some proper character development. And I think this is absolutely perfect because Malik kind of lulls you into this sense, uh, this kind of dreamlike effect, where you're kind of just feeling things instead of, uh, you know, the sen the senses in this film. You know, my senses were altered in a way. Um, and it's just through everything, you know, the editing, um, the way it's shot, you know, and the narration, and the fact that there's not much dialogue at first. Um, and you know, not, not too much about the, the film overall, but <clears throat> you know, the way that the first act kind of lulls you into this uh, sense of kind of just uh, a dream, um, it's just wonderful. And you know, the magic hour, of course, uh, contributes to that massively. You know, Malik would wait until the sun is setting at such a, a certain point to, to film most of the scenes, uh, the exterior scenes, that is. Um, of course, that led to a massive, you know, massively long overlong uh, shoot um, and you know many were pissed off of course as always in film uh, with these things but um, look what happened you know it made one of the one of the greatest films of all time for me um, and it just adds you know it's a such a perfectionism you can you can tell of in every single frame every shot of every frame um, but you know that magic hour um, the, the kind of way he achieved that it's just really unmatched, um, and it just adds to to the nostalgia of it, and it just films. It feels like um, it takes place really not just a period film, <clears throat> you know, in nineteen ten, uh, but kind of another reality, you know, another world, um, just through everything, you know, the editing and everything, and just the way it's shot, and uh, just the way that Malik just uh, handles uh, the characters as well, and the romance. Uh, it's such an uplifting romance at times, um, and other times it's tragic, and uh, you know just so emotional and stuff and sad in places <clears throat> of course I won't ruin what actually happens but um, you know it comes to a conclusion which is you know one of the most affecting in cinema uh, you know it's Sam Shepard as well um, the farmer um, you know before this film he was actually a playwright um, I don't believe he'd ever acted before this film um, and he gives a stunning performance um, you know maybe you know the most subtle performance in the film um, but, you know, I, I really, I just think this is so underrated and so under-talked about. Um, his performance in this film is, is masterful. Um, you know, just the, the glances that he gives throughout certain key moments in the film. Um, you know, he makes he makes that more. You know, he's one of the characters that really just uh, make the story so, you know, emotional and stuff. And just some of his reactions to what's going on, uh, I won't ruin, of course. It's really just so powerful and it always sticks with you. You know, since I saw it, I remember everything that happened really in this film on the surface, like, you know, the, the key scenes. Um, and of course, on my third viewing, it's only gotten better and uh, all the little details and, and actually some of the character moments, the development, some of the conversations that, you know, you don't quite remember at first because it's more of this, <clears throat> you know, visual experience and you remember the visuals and the the actual events and the music and everything and the feeling of the film um, that's the thing that sticks with you in the first view I, I guess but when you see it more and more you, you know you, you gradually uh, you know everything else comes into play even more so um, and you know this made it into my top 50 when I first saw it I thought it was one of the most mind-blowing films I've ever seen now it's even higher um, and certainly after this this, this view and you know, seeing it on Criterion um, seeing it on you know the big screen once again <clears throat> you know, um, it's just absolutely stunning, and um, I really think this is uh, one of the absolute finest films ever made. Um, but you know, Sam Shepard, uh, Brooke Adams, Richard Gere. You know, people people mock Richard Gere a lot, uh, say he's a crap actor. Um, and to be honest, I've not seen him in too much. Um, but I bet a lot, a lot of people have never actually heard of this film, um, and have never actually, you know, known where he came from, where he started, really. And this is the film. Um, and this is, I don't imagine any other uh, you know films that he's he's been in to be giving him you know him giving a better performance than this because um, for me it's one of the eight, one for the ages. It's better than uh, most performances I've seen um, <clears throat> in terms of what he was meant to do. Uh, it's such a subtle performance, but you know once again like uh, Martin Sheen's character, um, 
you know, it's a bit. Uh, he's a bit of an unpredictable character. Um, it's just all the the eye movement, you know, the eye contact and everything, and just the expressions he has that that are just so powerful. You know, he's such a great actor in this film, masterful performance for sure. And of course, really the most complex character, most most interesting, you could say, is Linda. Um, <clears throat> and also, though she doesn't really have too much character development through other characters, she's the narrator. Um, and of course, just the change that she goes through in this film is really, really just something. Um, and it's, as I keep saying, it's only 90 minutes long. And I just can't believe how, how much ground is covered in this film, um, how much um, you just care for these characters, even though there's not massive amounts of dialogue. Because Malik uses visual uses visual storytelling, um, you know, it's some of the finest uses of visual storytelling, and the way he develops the characters through through their actions and just through, you know, just you observing the characters uh, and how they react with one another. Um, but you know, Linda is such a <coughs> a great character and one that I've just always remembered since I saw it. Um, but you know, the whole cast, these four players, you know, the the, the four main cast, um, are all perfect in this film. Brooke Adams, you know, such a warm character as well. And just I just cared so much throughout this film about the you know the relationships between these characters, the fact that it's mainly the three of them that, that started off, um, you know, and and just the way you know that, that she's his younger sister and stuff, Richard Gere, and just the warmth that comes through throughout the film, and just the journey they they all have together, and you know the outcome is just so affecting. Um, cannot, you know, that's an understatement to say this film is, <coughs> you know, one of the most emotional of all time. I just get you know overwhelmed with, uh, with with feeling in this film. You know the tone of this film is uh, perfect throughout the entire film. You know it's like The Godfather. There's not a single false note, a single note that that, that brings you know breaks the tone. Um, I believe, and um, you know of course many disagree. Um, you know when you look at rankings of Terence Malick uh, films, you don't really nowadays see this one anywhere near the top. Um, you know sometimes I've seen it in five, six, sometimes seven. You know it, it's not. It's not always a loved film, um, but for me, um, it's an absolute masterpiece. But you know, it goes beyond. This film goes beyond what, what you know a checklist would. You know, a checklist film, as in, Malik doesn't have time for a checklist of what makes a perfect film. He's already going further, um, I believe, and uh, you know, he, he, he just goes really to, to almost the heights of cinema for me uh, with this film. It's one of the absolute greatest epics of all time, and. Um, Absolutely flawless. Um, <clears throat> you know the editing as well. Um, some of the absolute finest editing of all time. Up there with 2001 A Space Odyssey, Clockwork Orange. Um, Good, Good, The Bad and the Ugly, uh, The Godfather Part 2. You know, all these films. It's got some of the absolute greatest editing of all time. The editing in this film, there's a lot of, uh, you know, slow fades, dissolves. Uh, and that adds to, to, the, uh, to the fact that this is an epic. And it just makes the, the time kind of, Really, when, with this film, you know, I, I I didn't, I never, whenever I watch this film, basically, I always um, lose sense of time completely, you know, it's one of them films, but uh, it has such an effect where, you know, I just don't, I don't really comprehend how much time we've spent, um, you know, it's only 90 minutes, of course, but I wouldn't know if it was 90, if it was 45, if it was three hours, really, if I didn't know the time, because it's just a film I get so lost in, um, and just so... You lose sense of any sort of, um, you know, anything else going on, reality. Although, of course, it's rooted in realism, this film. Um, but it is a fantastical film in some ways, in many ways, sorry. <clears throat> and, you know, just some of the, the best period films, um, I think, actually, are the ones that, that kind of feel like a fantasy, but also very real. Um, and this is just achieved through everything, you know, the, the combination of the editing, the music, the way it's shot, the lighting, everything. Um, Absolutely perfect. Um, cannot fault this film, but once again, it's one of them ones that just go beyond perfection for me. Um, I think this is better than Lawrence of Arabia, you know, in terms of an epic, and uh, it's only 90 minutes. I just can't believe, you know, for an epic, for this to feel this big, you know, to feel massive in scope. Um, it's such an achievement, you know, a wonderful achievement, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, the scope of it is just always, it, it, it doesn't, you know, it never feels too big in, in a sense that you're always focused on these, these main characters. It's such a personal film. You never lose sense of uh, you know, the relationships that's going on. And the love triangle in this film, really, um, for me, it's only 
It's maybe only overtaken by one film in particular, which is another epic film, uh, I Won't Ruin Witch. It's just absolutely flawless, the love triangle in this film. It brings out all the characters um, just through each other, you know, the way that things pan out. Sam Shepard is absolutely stunning. Richard Gere is probably even better. Um, and just all the characters in this film, I cared so much about these characters. Um, this film, you know, means so much to me, uh, and it's just directed to perfection. Um, for me, you know, I, I've already said, you know, you'll know by the end of this review <coughs> what my favourite Malik is. Um, you know, I, I said Badlands one of the 40 best films I've ever seen. I think this is uh, even better than Badlands, and I think this is Malik's greatest film. Um, and you know what? It could be in my top 25 of all time. It's that good. Um, it probably is, actually. And uh, I cannot fault this film, but you know, it just goes beyond perfection, what you think a cinema can produce. And it's one of them films, like The Godfather, um, that just goes beyond that. <clears throat> you know, and just such a feeling to this film. There's not a single scene, really, that doesn't make me feel really emotional. Um, and it's just such a warm film, once again, full of heart. And, and this is, for me, Malik's uh, strongest case of showing how much, you know, he is passionate about filmmaking and, and nature as well, you know, the way that nature plays into it. The locust scene, you know, uh, it's just so uh, perfect. And, you know, this is Days of Heaven, this film is called. But it also has Days of Hell, you could say. That, you know, some of that final act, uh, the last third of the film, really, it's kind of just uh, symbolises hell. Uh, and it's to do with, obviously, of course, what happens within the film. <clears throat> you know, the choices the characters take. I think that was definitely a symbolism, uh, you yeah, know, symbol for that. Um, and just, it's not heavy handed at all in this film though, you know, it, it, the symbolism and all the, you know, the, the, uh, the meanings of this film, the themes it explores, uh, it does it with such a, nat a natural way, sorry, um, but also it's just so cinematic, um, there's not a single moment where it breaks tone, or it doesn't, you know, that it breaks immersion, um, because I was completely invested in this film throughout, have been every time, and, uh, it's one of them films that just takes a complete, you know, hold on me. Um, so overall, um, taking everything into account, you know, I, I've kind of explained everything I need to, although it's still not enough to, to kind of give this film, do this film justice. Um, taking everything into account, the editing, direction, the cinematography, music, um, absolutely mind-blowing, um, and all of the characters, but the way that Mar Malik um, naturally introduces us to the characters, um, creates such a dynamic uh, love triangle. The narration is just so perfect, it's only really beaten by A Clockwork Orange for me. It really, uh, or maybe one other film. Um, it's in the top three uh, narrations of all time for me. It's that good, uh, you know. And it's kind of improvised, so it's just so remarkable that it actually works so perfectly. Because <clears throat> it never feels like um, it doesn't relate to what's going on in any way, you know. As opposed to, say, Knight of Cups, uh, Malik film. Um, I'd give this film, you know, it, my highest rating, uh, it has to be, and uh, since it's my favourite Malick film, one of my eight best films, uh, favourite films of the 70s, it's 100% plus, tier S, um, I think it's, uh, you know, Terence Malick's best, and, um, <clears throat> you know, one of the very, one of the very, very, very finest films ever made, um, and, um, the script is so perfect, although, of course, um, there's not too much of it. But it's, you know, it's the way that Malik just brings it all together. And uh, really just, this is flawless. Um, such an emotional film for me. And, uh, you know, it's quite hard to talk about at times. But, you know, I think about it um, in between each time I watch it. I, it's one of them films that I just think about all the time, even when I'm not watching it. You know, I listen to the soundtrack, um, just, just everything, you know, and reading up on you know, the actual making of the film. Highly recommend Days of Heaven, <clears throat> you know, it's not like some say, um, a film that's not accessible, I really, I don't think anyway, you know, I, I watched this before Badlands and, um, you know, I completely just straight away invest, got invested in this film and uh, it's not a film that's um, pretentious at all in any way, unlike some of his other later works I think, um, <clears throat> in particular To The Wonder, um, but yes, uh, it's not pretentious at all. Um, a highly emotional film with just so much, you know, universal themes. Uh, it's full of hope. Uh, it's full of wonder, you know, and, and to do, of course, with narration um, throughout this film. But Days of Heaven for me, uh, Terence Malick's absolute grace film, and um, 
can't really describe how much I love this film. It's, it's pretty much in my top 25. Um, you know, I'll be I'll be maybe doing some uh, videos where I analyse this film. Um, you know, more in more depth. Um, but yes, um, the only Malik film I've got left to review, rewatch and review, is the Thin Red Line. Um, and of course, if you've seen this review all the way now, you'll know, of course, that it's not my favourite Malik. Uh, but see what I give this film on my um, next Terence Malik review. Um, of course, another divisive film, like all of his films, really. Um, but for me, Days of Heaven easily is his best. It's by far his best, and uh, as I say, one of the greatest epics, one of the greatest films in cinema. Um, wonderful. Um, so, thanks for watching my review of Days of Heaven.